Preface of Elves and Heroes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. Preface The Elves. The immemorial folk beliefs of our native land are passing away, but they still retain for us a poetic appeal not only on account of the glamour of early associations, but also because they afford us inviting glimpses of the mental habits and inherent characteristics of the men and women of past generations. When we retell the old tales of our ancestors, we sit beside them over the peat fire, and as we glory with them in their strong heroes and share their elemental joys and fears, we breathe the palpitating air of that old mysterious world of theirs, peopled by spirits beautiful and strange and awe-inspiring. The attitude of the Gael towards the supernatural, and his general outlook upon life in times gone by, was not associated with unbroken gloom, nor was he always an ineffectual dreamer and melancholy fatalist. These attributes belong chiefly to the literary Celt of latter-day conception, the Celt of Arnold and Renan, and other writers following in their wake, who have woven misty impressions of a people whom they have met as strangers, and never really understood. Celtic literature is not a morbid literature. In Highland poetry there is more light than shadow, much symbolism, but no vagueness. Pictures are presented in minute detail. Stanzas are cunningly wrought in a spirit of keen artistry, and the literary style is direct and clear and comprehensible. In Highland folklore we find associated with the haunting fear of things invisible, common to all peoples in early stages of development, a confident feeling of security, inspired by the minute observances of ceremonial practices. We also note a distinct tendency to discriminate between spirits, some of which are invariably friendly, some merely picturesque, and perhaps fearsome, and others constantly harboring a desire to work evil upon mankind. Associated with belief in the efficacy of propitiatory offerings, and ceremonies of riddance, is the ethical suggestion that good wishes and good deeds influence spirits to perform acts of kindly intent. Of fairies the Highlander spoke as they are still prone to do in these districts where belief in them is not yet extinct, with no small degree of regard and affection. It may be that the good folk, and the peace people, Sitchin, were so called that good intention might be compelled by the conjuring influence of a name, as well as to avoid giving offence by uttering real names, as if it were desired to exercise a magical influence by their use. Be that as it may, it is evident from Highland folk tales that the fairies were oftener the friends than the foes of mankind. When men and women were lured to their dwellings, they rarely suffered injury. Indeed, the fairies appeared to have taken pleasure in their company. To such as the favored, they imparted the secrets of their skill in the arts of piping, of sword-making, etc. At sowing time or harvest, they were at the service of human friends. On the needy, they took pity. They never failed in a promise, they never forgot an act of kindness, which they invariably rewarded sevenfold. Against those who wronged them, they took speedy vengeance. It would appear that on these humanized spirits of his conception, the Highlander left, as one would expect him to do, the impress of his own character, his shrewdness and high sense of honor, his love of music and gaiety, his warmth of heart and love of comrades, and his indelible hatred of tyranny and wrong. The Highland wee folk are not so diminutive as the fairies of England, at least that type of fairy, beloved of the poet, which hovers bee-like over flowers and feeds on honeydew. Power they had to shrink in stature and render themselves invisible, but they are invariably little people, from three to four feet high. It may be that the Gael's conception of humanized spirits may not have been uninfluenced by the traditions of that earlier diminutive race whose arrowheads of flint were so long regarded as elf-bolts. The fairies dwelt only in grassy knolls, on the summits of high hills and inside cliffs, Although capable of living for several centuries, they were not immortal. They required food, and borrowed meal and cooking utensils from human beings, and always returned what they received on loan. They could be heard within the knolls grinding corn and working at their anvils, and they were adepts at spinning and weaving and harvesting. When they went on long journeys they became invisible, and were carried through the air on eddies of western wind. At the seasonal changes of the year, the wee folk were for several days on end inspired, like all other supernatural furies, with enmity against mankind. 
their evil influences were negatived by spells and charms. We who still hang on our walls at Christmas, the mystic holly, are unconsciously perpetuating an old-world custom connected with the belief in the efficacy of the magical circle to protect us against evil spirits. And in our concern about luck, our proneness to believe in omens, the influence of colors and numbers, in dreams and in prophetic warnings, we retain as much of the spirit as the poetry of the religion of our remote ancestors. THE HEROES The heroes, with the exception of Cuchulain, who appears in this volume, figure in the tales and poems of the Oceanic or Fion cycle, which is common to Ireland and to Scotland. They have been neglected by our Scottish poets since Gavin Douglas and Barbour. In Ireland the Fians are a band of militia, the original Fenians. In Scotland the tales vary considerably, and belong to the hunting period before the introduction of agriculture. But in this country, as well as in Ireland, they are evidently influenced by historic happenings. There are tales of Norse conflicts, as well as tales of adventure among giants and spirits. The cycle had evidently remote beginnings. When we find Yarmid and Grianne, like Paris and Helen, the cause of conflict and disaster, and Yarmid, like Achilles, charmed of body and vulnerable only on his heel spot, we incline to the theory that from a mid European centre, migrating waves swept over prehistoric Greece and left traces of their mythology and folklore in Homer, while other waves, sweeping northward, bequeathed to us as a literary inheritance the Celtic folk tales in which the deeds and magical attributes of remote tribal heroes and humanized deities are commingled and perpetuated. On fragments of these folk tales, the poet Macpherson reared his oceanic epic, in imitation of the Iliad and Paradise Lost. The Death of Cuchulain is a rendering in verse of an Irish prose translation of a fragment of the Cuchulain cycle, which moves in the Bronze Age period. Cuchulain, with the light of heroes on his forehead, is also reminiscent of Achilles. One of the few Cuchillan tales found in Scotland is that which relates his conflict with his son, and bears a striking similarity to the legend of Sorab and Rustum. Macpherson also drew from this cycle in composing his Ossian, and mingled it with the other, with which it has no connection. The third great Celtic cycle, the Arthurian, bears close resemblances, as Campbell of the West Highland Tales has shown, to the Fian cycle, and had evidently a common origin. Its value as a source of literary inspiration has been fully appreciated, but the Fian and Cuchulain cycles still await, like virgin soil, to yield an abundant harvest for the poets of the future. Notes on the folk beliefs and tales will be found at the end of this volume. Some of the short poems have appeared in the Glasgow Herald and Inverness Courier. The three tales appeared in the Celtic Review. End of Preface Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter One of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter One The Wee Folk. In the knoll that is the greenest, and the gray cliff side, and on the lonely bend top the wee folk bide. They'll flit among the heather and trip upon the bray. The wee folk, the green folk, the red folk, and gray. As o'er the moor at midnight the wee folk pass, They whisper among the rushes and o'er the green grass. All through the marshy places they glint and pass away, The light folk, the lone folk, the folk that will not stay. O oh, many a fairy milkmaid, with the one eye blind, Is mid the lonely mountains by the red deer hind. Not one will wait to greet me, for they have naught to say, The hill folk, the still folk, the folk that flit away. When the golden moon is glinting in the deep, dim wood, There's a fairy piper playing to the elfin brood. They dance and shout and turn about, And laugh and swing and sway, The droll folk, the knoll folk, The folk that dance all way. O oh, we that bless the wee folk, Have naught to fear, And ne'er an elfin arrow will come us near. For they'll give skill in music, and every wish obey, The wise folk, the peace folk, the folk that work and play. They'll hasten here at harvest, they will shear and bind, They'll come with elfin music on a western wind. 
All night they'll sit among the sheaves, or herd the kind that stray, the quick folk, the fine folk, the folk that ask no pay. Betimes they will be spinning, the while we sleep. They'll clamber down the chimney, or through the keyholes creep. And when they come to borrow meal, we'll ne'er send them away, the good folk, the honest folk, the folk that work all way. Oh, never wrong the wee folk, the red folk and the green, nor name them on the Fridays, or at Halloween. The helpless and unwary then, and bairns they lure away, the fierce folk, the angry folk, the folk that steal and slay. End of the Wee Folk Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 2 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 2 Bonach Felade. The Remnant Bannock. Oh, the good wife will be singing when her meal is all but done. Now my bannocks I have baked. I've baked them all but one. And I'll dust the board to bake it. I'll bake it with a spell. Oh, it's Finlay's little bannock for going to the well. The bannock on the brander smells sweet for your desire. Oh, my crisp ones I will count not on two sides of the fire. And not a farl has fallen some evil to foretell. Oh, it's Finlay's little bannock for going to the well. The bread would not be lasting. T'would crumble in your hand when fairies would be coming here to turn the meal to sand. But what will keep them dancing in their own green dell? Oh, it's Finlay's little bannock for going to the well. Now not a fairy finger will do my baking harm, The little bannock with the hole, oh, it will be the charm. I need it, I need it, twixt my palms, And all the bairns I tell, oh, it's Finlay's little bannock For going to the well. End of Bonnock Felade Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 3 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 3 The Banshee. Knee deep she waded in the pool, the banshee robed in green. She sang yon song the whole night long, and washed the linen clean. The linen that would wrap the dead she beetled on a stone. She stood with dripping hands, blood red low singing all alone. His linen robes are pure and white, for Fergus Moore must die to-night. T'was Fergus Moore rode o'er the hill, come back from foreign wars. His horse's feet were clattering sweet below the pitiless stars, and in his heart he would repeat, Oh, never again I'll roam. All weary is the going forth, but sweet the coming home. His linen robes are pure and white, for Fergus Moore must die to-night. He saw the blaze upon his hearth come gleaming down the glen, for he was fain for home again, and rode before his men. Tis many a weary day, he'd sigh, since I would leave her side. I'll never more leave Scotland's shore, and yon my dark-eyed bride. His linen robes are pure and white, for Fergus Moore must die to-night. So, dreaming of her tender love, soft tears his eyes would blind, when up there crept and swiftly leapt a man who stabbed behind. "'Tis you,' he cried, "'who stole my bride. This night shall be your last.' When Fergus fell, the warm red tide of life came ebbing fast. His linen robes are pure and white, for Fergus Moore must die to-night." End of the Banshee. Recording by Matthew Rees. Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 4 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 4. Khan, Son of the Red. The Fians sojourned by the shore of comely Cromarty, and o'er the wooded hill pursued the chase with ardor. 
"'Twas a full moon's space ere Beltane rites would be begun "'with homage to the rising sun. "'Ere to the spirits of the dead would sacrificial blood be shed, "'in yon green grove of navity. "'When Khan came over the eastern sea, "'his heart aflame with vengeful ire, "'to seek for Gaul, who slew his sire when he was seven years old. "'Finn saw in dreams, ere yet he came, "'with awe the Red One's son, so fierce and bold, in combat with his hero old, the king-like Gaul of valorous might, a stormy billow in the fight no foe could e'er withstand. He knew the strange ship bore brave Khan, and blew clear on his horn the warning call, and round him thronged the Fians all with wondering gaze. The sun drew nigh the bale-fires of the western sky, and faggot clouds with blood-red glare caught flame, and in the radiant air lone wivis like a jewel shone, the Fians, as they stared at Khan, were stooping on the high lookout. They watched the ship that tacked about, now slant across the firth, and now laid bare below the cliff's broad brow, and heaving on a billowy steep, like to a monster of the deep, that wallowed, laboring in pain, and Khan stared back with cold disdain. Pondering, he sat alone behind the broad sail swallowing the wind, as over the hollowing waves that leapt and snarled with foaming lips, and swept around the bows in querulous fray, and tossed in curves of drenching spray, the belching ship with ardor drove. Then, like a lordly elk that strove amid the hounds, and charging, rent the pack asunder as it went, it bore round and in beauty sprang. The sea wind through the cordage sang, with high and wintry merriment, that stirred the heart of Khan, intent on vengeance and for battle keen, so hard so steadfast and serene. Then Ossian, sweet of speech, spake low, with musing eyes upon the foe. Is Khan more noble than the Red, whom Gaul in battle vanquished? The Red was fiercer, Conan cried. Nay, Khan is nobler, Finn replied, more comely, stalwart, mightier far. What sayest thou, Gaul, my man of war? Then Gaul made answer on the steep, nor ceased to gaze on Khan full deep. His equal never came before across the seas to Alban shore, nor ever have I peered upon a nobler, mightier man than Khan. The ship flew seaward, tacking wide, contending with the wind and tide, and when upon the broad stream's track it baffled hung, or drifted back, with grunt and shriek, like battling boars, the shock and swing of bladed oars came sounding o'er the sea. The dusk grew round the twilight like a husk that holds a kernel choice, and keen, cold stars impaled the sky serene, when Khan's ship through the slackening tide drew round the wistful bay and wide, behind the headlands high that snout the seas like giant whales, and spout the salt foam high and loud. Then sighed the gasping men who all day plied their oars in plunging seas, with hands grown stiff, and arms like twisted bands drawn numbly as they rose outspent and staggering from their benches went. The sail napped quarrelling, and drank the wind in broken gasps, and sank with sullen pride upon the boards, and smote the mast, and shook the cords. Darkly loomed that alien land, and darkly lowered the Fian band, for hovering on the shoreland grey, the ship they followed round the bay, nor sought the sheltering woods until the shadows folded o'er the hill, full heavily, and night fell blind, and laid its spell upon the wind. The swelling waters sank with sip, and hollow gurgle round the ship. The long mast rocked against the dim, soft heaven above the headland's rim. But while the seamen crouched to sleep, Khan sat alone in reverie deep, and saw before him in amaze the mute procession of his days, in gloom and glamour wending fast, his heart a-hungering for the past. Again he leapt, a tender boy, to greet his sire with eager joy. When he came over the wide North Sea, enriched with spoils of victory, then heavily loomed that fateful morn when tidings of his fall were borne from Alban shore. Again he saw the youth, who went alone with awe, to swear the avenging oath before the smoking altar, red with gore. Ah! strange to him it seemed to be that hour was drawing nigh when he would vengeance take, and still more strange, O oh sorrow, it would bring no change, though blood for blood be spilled, and life for life be taken in fierce strife. Twill ne'er recall the life long sped, or break the silence of the dead. But when he heard his mother's wail once more uplifted on the gale, 
moaning the red who ne'er returned his cheeks with sudden passion burned and darkly frowned that valiant man as through his quivering body ran the lightnings of impelling ire and impulses of fierce desire that surged with a consuming hate against a world made desolate unceasing and unreconciled and ever clamoring like wild dark deeded waves that stun the shore and through the anguished twilight roar the hungry passions of the wide and gluttonous deep unsatisfied two the shredding dawn in beauty spread its shafts of splendor golden red high over the eastern heaven and broke through flaking clouds in silvern smoke that burst aflame and fold o'er fold let loose their oozing floods of gold splashed over the foamless deep that lay tremulous and clear in fiery play the rippling beams that swept between the sea-cleft suitor crags serene broke quivering where the waters bore the soft reflection of the shore the pipes of morn were sounding shrill through budding woods on plain and hill and stirred the air with song to wake the sweet-toned birds within the brake the fians from their sheilings came with offerings to the god aflame and round them thrice they sunwise went then naked need in silence bent beside the pillar stones but now brave khan upon the ship's high prow hath raised his burnished blade on high and calls on woden and on Tai with boldness to avenge the death of his great sire in one deep breath he drains the hero's draught that burns with valor of the gods then turns his long-sought foe to meet great khan sweeps stooping in a boat alone shoreward with rapid blades and bright that shower the foam rain pearly white and rip the waters bending lithe in hollowing swirls that hiss and writhe like adders ere they dart away bright spotted with the flakes of spray when furrowing the sand he drew his boat the shallowing water through a giant he in stature rose straight as a mast before his foes with head thrown high and shoulders wide and level and set back with pride his bared and supple arms were long as shapely oars firm as a thong his right hand grasped his gleaming blade gold hilted and of keen bronze made in leaf and shape with stately stride he crossed the level sands and wide then on his shield the challenge gave his broad sword thundering like a wave for single combat red as gold his locks upon his shoulders rolled a brazen helmet on his head flashed fire his cheeks were white and red and all the fians watched with awe that hero young with knotted jaw whose eyes set deep and blue and hard surveyed their ranks with cold regard while his broad forehead seamed with care drooped shadowily his eyebrows fair were sloping sideways o'er his eyes with pondering o'er the mysteries the eyes of all the fians sought heroic gall whose face was wrought with lines of deep perplexing thought for gazing on the valiant khan he mourned that his own youth was gone when strong and fierce and bold he shed the life-blood of the boastful red whom none save he would meet he heard the challenge and nor spake nor stirred nor feared but now grown old when hate and lust of glory satiate his heart took pride in khan and shared the kinship of the brave who dared to meet the viking bold if he the succor of the band should be found faltering or in despair until that day the fians ne'er of one man had such fear old gall sat musing on a grassy knoll they deemed he shared their dread not so wise finn who spake forth firm and slow gall son of morna peerless man the keen desire of every clan far famed for many a valiant deed strong hero in the time of need i vaunt not khan nor deem that thou dost falter save with meekness now but why shouldst thou not take the head of this bold youth as of the red his sire in other days gall spake o noble finn for thy sweet sake mine arms i'd seize with ready hand although to answer thy command my blood to its last drop were spilled by crom were all the fians killed my sword would never fail to be a strong defence to succour thee upon his hard right arm with haste his crooked and pointed shield he braced he clutched his sword in his left hand while round that hero of the band the fian warriors pressed and praised his valour mute was gall they raised smiting their hands the battle-cry to urge him on to victory 
the one-eyed Gaul went forth alone. His face was like a mountain stone, cold, hard, and gray. His deep-drawn breath came heavily, like a man nigh death. But his firm mouth, with lips drawn thin, deep sunken in his wrinkled skin, was cunningly crooked. His hair was white, on his bald forehead gleamed a bright and livid scar that Khan's great sire had cloven when their sword struck fire. Burly and dauntless, full of might, old Gaul went humbly forth to fight with arrogant Khan. It seemed the red in greater might was from the dead, restored in his fierce son. A deep, swift silence fell, like sudden sleep, on all the Fians waiting there, in sharp suspense and half despair. The morn was still. A skylark hung in mid-air fluttering, and sung a lullaby that grew more sweet amid the stillness in the heat and splendor of the sun. The lisp of faint wind, in the herbage crisp, went past them, and around the bare and foam-striped sandbanks gleaming fair, the faintly panted waves were cast by the wan deep fatigued and vast. O oh, great was Khan in that dread hour, and all the Fians feared his power, and watched as in a darksome dream the warriors meet. They saw the gleam of swift uplifted swords, and then a breathless moment came, as when the lithe and living lightning's flash makes pause, until the thunder's crash is splintered through the air. Loud o'er the blue sea and the shining shore broke forth the crash of arms, the roll of Khan's fierce blows that baffled Gaul on sword and shield resounding rang, while that old warrior stooped and sprang sideways, and swerved or backward leapt, as swiftly as the bronze blade swept above him and around. He swayed, stumbling, but rose. But though his blade was ever nimble to defend, the Fians feared the fight would end in victory for Khan. "'Twas like as when an eagle swoops to strike, but swerves with fluttering wings, as nigh its head a javelin gleams. A cry that banished fear of Khan's great blows from out the Fian ranks arose, as like a plumed reed in a gust Gaul suddenly stooped, a deadly thrust that drew the first blood in the fray he darting gave, with quick dismay the valiant Khan drew back. Again he leapt at Gaul, but sought in vain to blind him with his blows that fell like snowflakes on a sullen well. For Gaul was calm, while great Khan raged, as hour by hour the conflict waged. He was a blast-defying tree, a crag that spurned a furious sea. And all the Fians with one mind set firm their faith in Gaul. The wind rose like a startled bird from out the heather at the huntsman's shout, in swift and blustering flight. At noon the sun rolled in a cloudy swoon dimly, and over the rolling deep gust followed gust with shadowy sweep and waves that streamed their snowy locks were tossing high against the rocks seaward, while round the sands ebbed wide scrambled the fierce devouring tide. Oh, Khan was like a hound at morn that springs upon an elk forlorn among the hills. He was a proud cascade that leaps a cliff with loud unspending fall, so fierce, so fair was arrogant Khan, but Gaul fought there keen-eyed, with ready guard, at bay. He was as a boar in that fierce fray. The waves were humbled on the shore, and silent fell amid the roar and crash of battle, mute and still. The Fians watched, while on the hill the little elves came out and gazed, to be amused, and were amazed. They saw upon the shrinking sands the warriors with restless hands and busy blades, with shields that rose to buffet the unceasing blows. They saw before the rising flood the flash of fire, the flash of blood, and watched the men with panting breath, striving to be the slaves of death now darting wide, now swerving round, now clashed together in a bound, with splitting swords that smote so fast as hour by hour unheeded passed. The sands were torn and tossed like spray, before the whirlwind of the fray, that waged in fury till the sun sank, and the day's last loops were spun. Then terrible was Gaul, he rose a tempest of increasing blows, more furious and fast, as dim uncertain twilight fell. More grim and great he grew, as looming large he fought, and pressed to the marge of ocean, he o'erpowered and drave the Viking hero back, till wave or ready wave that hurried fleet snuffled and snarled about their feet. Then, with a mighty shout that made the rocks around him ring, his blade swept like a flash of fire to smite the last fell blow in that fierce fight. So great Khan perished like the red by Gaul's left hand, 
his life-blood spread over the quenching sands where rolled his head entwined with locks of gold then passed like thunder o'er the sea the fian shout of victory and trembling on the tossing ships the vikings heard with voiceless lips and dim despairing eyes alone stood gaul and like a silent stone bulking upon a benside bear he bent above the hero fair remembering the mighty red and wondering that Con lay dead. Footnote to Beltane, May Day. End footnote. Footnote to Navity, Traditional Holy Hill. End footnote. End of Con, Son of the Red. Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter Five of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter Five, The Song of Gaul. O son of the red, undone and laid dead, the blood of a hero my cold blade hath shed. Who fought me today? Who sought me to slay? THE SON OF YON HIGH KING I SLEW IN THE FRAY. O BLADE THAT YON BRAVE LOW LAID IN THE GRAVE, YE GLADDENED THE FIANS, BUT GRIEF TO CON GAVE. STONE-HEARTED AND STRONG, LONE-HEARTED WITH LONG, DARK BROODING, HE SOUGHT TO AVENGE HIS DEEP WRONG. FAIR SON OF THE RED, CARE NONE, THOU ART DEAD. OLD GAUL OF CLAN MORNA, WILL MOURN THOU HAST BLED. O oh, where shall be found to share with thee round the halls of Valhalla, thy glory renowned? O oh, true as the blade that slew thee, and made my fear and thine anger forever to fade. Ah, when upon earth again will have birth a son of such honor and bravery and worth? Above thee in splendor a love that could render brave service burned star-like and constant and tender. With fearing my name, with hearing my fame, O oh, none would dare combat with Gaul till Con came. O oh, great was thine ire, the fate of thy sire, Awaiting thy coming, consumed thee like fire. O oh, son of the red, undone and laid dead, The blood of a hero my cold blade hath shed. End of the Song of Gaul Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 6 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 6 The Blue Men of the Minch. When the tide is at the turning, and the wind is fast asleep, and not a wave is curling on the wide blue deep, Oh, the waters will be churning on the stream that never smiles, Where the blue men are splashing round the charmed isles. As the summer wind goes droning o'er the sun-bright seas, And the minch is all a-dazzle to the Hebrides, They will skim along like salmon, you can see their shoulders gleam, And the flashing of their fingers in the blue men's stream. But when the blast is raving and the wild tide races, The blue men are breast-high, with foam-gray faces. They'll plunge along with fury while they sweep the spray behind. Oh, they'll bellow o'er the billows and wail upon the wind. And if my boat be storm-tossed and beating for the bay, they'll be howling and be growling as they drench it with their spray. For they'd like to heel it over to their laughter while it lists, or crack the keel between them, or stave it with their fists. O oh, weary on the blue men, their anger and their wiles, The whole day long, the whole night long, They're splashing round the isles. They'll follow every fisher, ah, they'll haunt the fisher's dream, When billows toss, oh, who would cross the blue men's stream? End of the Blue Men of the Minch Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 7 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 7. The Urisk. Oh, the night I met the Urisk on the wide lone moor. Ah, would I be forgetting of the thing that came with me? For it was big, and black as black, and it was dour as dour. It shrank and grew, and had no shape of aught I e'er did see. For it came creeping like a cloud that's moving all alone, Without the sounds of footsteps, and I heard its heavy sighs. Its face was old and grey, and like a lichen-covered stone, And its tangled locks were dropping o'er its sad and weary eyes. Oh, it's never the word it had to say, in anger or in woe. It would not seek to harm me that had never done it wrong. As fleet, oh, like the deer, I went, or I went panting slow. That waysome thing came with me on that lonely road and long. Oh, eerie was the urisk that conveyed me o'er the moor, When I was all so helpless and my heart was full of fear. Nor when it was beside me or behind me was I sure, I knew it would be following, I knew it would be near. End of the Urisk Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 8 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 8 The Nimble Men Aurora Borealis When Angus Orr, the wizard, his fearsome wand will raise, The night is filled with splendor, and the north is all ablaze, from clouds of raven blackness, like flames that leap on high, all merrily dance the nimble men across the northern sky. Now come the merry maidens, all gowned in white and green, while the bold and ruddy fellows will be flitting in between. Oh, to hear the fairy piper who will keep them tripping by, the men and maids who merrily dance across the northern sky. Oh, the weird and waysome music, and the never-faltering feet, oh, their fast and strong embraces, and their kisses hot and sweet. There's a lost and languished lover with a fierce and jealous eye, as merrily flit the nimble folk across the northern sky. So now the dance is over, and the dancers sink to rest. There's a maid that has two lovers, and there's one she loves the best. He will cast him down before her, she will raise him with a sigh. Her love so bright who danced to-night Across the northern sky. Then up will leap the other, And up will leap his clan. Oh, the lover and his company Will fight them man to man, All shrieking from the conflict The merry maidens fly. There's a battle royal Raging now across the northern sky. Through all the hours of darkness The fearsome fight will last. They are leaping white with anger, And the blows are falling fast. And where the slain have tumbled, a pool of blood will lie. Oh, it's dripping on the dark green stones from out the northern sky. When yon lady seeks her lover in the cold and pearly morn, She will find that he has fallen by the hand that she would scorn. She will clasp her arms about him, and in her anguish die. Oh, never again will trip the twain across the northern sky. End of the Nimble Men Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 9 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 9 My Gunna. When my kine are on the hill, who will charm them from all ill? While I'll sleep at ease until all the cocks are crowing clear. Who'll be herding them for me? It's the elf I fain would see, For they're safe as safe can be When the gunna will be near. He will watch the long, weird night, When the stars will shake with fright, Or the ghostly moon leaps bright O'er the bend like Beltane fire. If my kind would seek the corn, He will turn them by the horn, and I'll find them all at morn, lowing sweet beside the byre. Crownba's bard has second sight, and he'll moan the gunna's plight, when the frosts are flickering white, and the kine are housed till day. 
for he'll see him perched alone on a chilly old grey stone, nibbling, nibbling at a bone that will maybe throw away. He's so hungry, he's so thin. If he'd come, we'd let him in, for a rag of fox's skin is the only thing he'll wear. He'll be chittering in the cold as he hovers round the fold, with his locks of glimmering gold, twined about his shoulders bare. End of My Gunna Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 10 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese. Chapter 10 The Gruagach Milkmaid's Song. The lightsome lad with yellow hair, the elfin lad that is so fair, he comes in rich and braw attire to loose the kine within the byre. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, he's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain to find my lad with yellow hair. He's dressed so fine, he's dressed so grand, a supple switch is in his hand. I've seen while I a-milking sat the shadow of his beaver hat. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, he's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain to find my lad with yellow hair. My chuckling lad, so full of fun, Around the corners he will run, Behind the door he'll sometimes jink, And blow to make my candle blink. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, He's tittering here, he's tittering there, I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain To find my lad with yellow hair. The elfin lad that is so bra, He'll sometimes hide among the straw, He's sometimes leering from the loft, He's tittering low, and tripping soft. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, He's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain To find my lad with yellow hair. And every time I'll milk the kine, He'll have his share, the luck be mine. I'll pour it in yon hollowed stone, He'll sup it when he's all alone. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, He's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain to find my lad with yellow hair. O oh me, if I'd his milk forget, nor cream nor butter I would get. Ye need na tell, I ken full well, on all my kind he'd cast his spell. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, he's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain to find my lad with yellow hair. On nights when I would rest at ease, the merry lad begins to tease. He'll loose the kind to take me out, And titter while I move about. My lightsome lad, my leering lad, He's tittering here, he's tittering there. I'll hear him plain, but seek in vain To find my lad with yellow hair. End of the Gruagach Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter 11 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese. Chapter 11 The Little Old Man of the Barn. When all the big lads will be hunting the deer, and no one for helping old Callum comes near, oh, who will be busy at threshing his corn? Who will come in the night and be going at morn? The Little Old Man of the Barn, yon little old man. A bodach forlorn will be threshing his corn, The little old man of the barn. When the peat will turn grey, And the shadows fall deep, And weary old Callum is snoring asleep, When yon plant by the door will keep fairies away, And the horseshoe sets witches a-wandering till day, The little old man of the barn, Yon little old man, Will thresh with no light in the mouth of the night, The little old man of the barn. For the bodach is strong, though his hair is so grey, He will never be weary when he goes away. The bodach is wise, he's so wise, he's so dear, When the lads are all gone, he will ever be near. The little old man of the barn, yon little old man, So tight and so bra he will bundle the straw, The little old man of the barn. 
End of The Little Old Man of the Barn. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 12 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese. Chapter 12 Yon Fairy Dog. Twas bold Macadrum of the Seals, whose heart would never fail, would hear yon fairy band dog fierce come howling down the gale. The pattering of the paws would sound like horses' hoofs on frozen ground, while o'er its back and curling round uprose its fearsome tail. "'Twas bold Macadrum of the seals, yon man that hath no fears, Beheld the dog with dark green back that bends not when it rears. Its sides were blacker than the night, but underneath the hair was white. Its paws were yellow, its eyes were bright, and blood-red were its ears. "'Twas bold Macadrum of the seals, the man who naught will dread, Would wait it, stooping with his spear, as nigh to him it sped. The big black head it turned and tossed, I'll strike, cried he, ere I'll be lost, for every living thing that crossed its path would tumble dead. Twas bold Macadrum of the seals, the man who ne'er took fright, would watch it bounding from the hills and o'er the moors in flight, when it would leave the uist shore, across the minch he heard it roar, like yon black cloud it bounded o'er the coolin hills that night. End of yon fairy dog, recording by Matthew Rees. Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 13 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese. Chapter 13 The Water Horse. Oh, the water horse will come over the heath with the foaming mouth and the flashing eyes. He's black above and he's white beneath. The hills are hearing the awesome cries. The sand lies thick in his dripping hair, And his hoofs are twined with weeds and wear. Alas for the man who would clutch the mane, There's no spell to help and no charm to save. Who rides him will never return again. Were he as strong, oh, were he as brave As Finn Mac Cool, of whom they'll tell, He thrashed the devil and made him yell. He'll gallop so fierce, he'll gallop so fast, So high he'll rear, and so swift he'll bound. Like the lightning flash he'll go prancing past, Like the thunder roll will his hoofs resound. And the man, perchance, who sees and hears, He would blind his eyes, he would close his ears. The horse will bellow, the horse will snort, And the gasping rider will pant for breath. Let the way be long, or the way be short, it will have one end, and the end is death. In yon black lock, from off the shore, The horse will splash and be seen no more. End of the Water Horse Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 14 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 14 The Changeling By night they came, and from my bed they stole my babe, And left behind a thing I hate, a thing I dread, A changeling who is old and blind. He's moaning all the night and day For those who took my babe away. My little babe was sweet and fair, He crooned to sleep upon my breast, but, oh, the burden I must bear, This drinks all day, and will not rest. My little babe had hair so light, And his is growing dark as night. Yon evil day when I would leave my little babe the stook behind, The fairies coming home at eve upon an eddy of the wind, Would cast their eyes with envy deep Upon my heart's love in his sleep. What holy woman will ye find To weave a spell and work a charm? A holy woman, pure and kind, Who'll keep my little babe from harm, Who'll make the evil changeling flee, And bring my sweet one back to me. End of the Changeling Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa
Chapter 15 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 15 My Fairy Lover. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, my fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing, for thee I'm crying. I would be dying, my love, for thee. Thine eyes were glowing like bluebells blowing, With dewdrops twinkling their silvery fires. Thine heart was panting with love enchanting, For mine was granting its fond desires. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, My fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing, for thee I'm crying, I would be dying, my love, for thee. Thy brow had brightness and lily whiteness, Thy cheeks were clear as yon crimson sea. Like broom buds gleaming, thy locks were streaming, As I lay dreaming, my love, of thee. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, My fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing, for thee I'm crying, I would be dying, my love, for thee. Thy lips that often with love would soften, They beamed like blooms for the honey-bee. Thy voice came ringing like some bird singing, When thou wert bringing thy gifts to me. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, My fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing, for thee I'm crying. I would be dying, my love, for thee. Oh, thou art forgetting the hours we met in the vale of tears at the eventide, or thou'd come near me to love and cheer me, and whisper clearly, Oh, be my bride. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, my fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing, for thee I'm crying. I would be dying, my love, for thee. What spell can bind thee? I search to find thee around the knoll that thy home would be. Where thou didst hover, my fairy lover, the clods will cover and comfort me. My fairy lover, my fairy lover, my fair, my rare one, come back to me. All night I'm sighing. On thee I'm crying. I would be dying, my love, for thee. End of My Fairy Lover Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 16 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 16 the Fians of Knockfarrel, a Rossshire legend. 1. On steep Knockfarrel had the Fians made, for safe retreat, a high and strong stockade around their dwellings. And when winter fell, and o'er Strathpeffer laid its barren spell, when days were bleak with storm, and nights were drear and dark and lonesome, well they loved to hear the songs of Ossian, peerless and sublime, their blind grey bard, grown old before his time, lamenting for his son, the young, the brave Oscar, who fell beside the western wave in Gavra's bloody and unequal fight. Round Ossian they would gather in the night, beseeching him for a song, and when he took his clarsac, from the magic strings he shook a maze of trembling music, falling sweet as mossy waters in the summer heat, and soft as fainting moor winds when they leave the fume of myrtle on a dewy eve. Bound flushed and teeming tarns that all might hear Low elfin pipings in the woodlands near. Twas thus he sang of love, And in a dream the fair maids sighed to hear. But when his theme was the long chase That Finn and all his men Followed with lightsome heart from glen to glen, His song was free as morn, And clear and loud as skylarks Caroling below a cloud in sweet June weather. And they heard the fall of mountain streams, the huntsman's windy call across the heaving hills, the baying hound among the rocks, while echoes answered round. They heard and shared the gladness of the chase. He sang the glories of the Fian race, whose fame is flashed through Alba far and wide. Their valorous deeds he sang with joy and pride. 
when their dark foemen from the west came o'er the ragged hills, and when on Krumba's shore the Viking hordes descending fought and fled, and one brave Khan who would avenge the red by one-eyed Gaul was slain. Of Finn he sang, and Dermaid, while the clash of conflict rang in billowy music through the hero's hall, and many a Fian gave the battle call when Ossian sang. Haggard and old, with slow and faltering steps, went winter through the snow, as if its dreary round would ne'er be done. The last long winter of their days, begun ere yet the latest flush of falling leaves had faded in the breath of chilling eaves, nor ended in the days of longer light when dawn and eve encroached upon the night. A weary time it was. The long strath lay snow-wreathed and pathless, and from day to day the tempests raved across the lowering skies, and they grew weak and pale, with hollow eyes, the while their stores shrank low, waiting the dawn of that sweet season, when through the woodlands wan, fresh flowers flutter and the wild birds sing. For winter, on the forelock of the spring, its icy fingers laid. The huntsmen pined in their dim dwellings, wearily confined, while the loud, hungry tempest held its sway. The red-eyed wolves grew bold, and came by day, and birds fell frozen in the snow. Then through the trackless strath a balmy south wind blew to usher lusty spring. Lo, in a night, the snows gan shrinking upon plain and height, and morning broke in brightness to the sound of falling waters, while a peace profound possessed the world around them, and the blue bared heaven above. Then all the Fians knew that winter's spell was broken, and each one made glad obeisance to the golden sun. Three days around Knockfarrel they pursued the chase across the hills and through the wood, round Ussie Loch and Dingwall's soundless shore, but meagre were the burdens that they bore at even to their dwellings. To the west, but sorrow not, said Finn, when all dismayed they hastened on a drear and bootless quest, with weary steps they turned to their stockade. Tomorrow we will hunt towards the east, to hide unscathe, and then make gladsome feast by night when we return. Or ever morn had broken, Finn arose, and on his horn blew loud the huntsman's blast that round the ben was echoed o'er and o'er. Then all his men gathered around him in the dusk, nor knew what dim forebodings filled his heart and drew his brows in furrowed care. His eyes agleam still stared upon the horrors of a dream of evil omen that in vain he sought to solve. His voice came faint from battling thought, and he to Gary spake, Be thou the ward, strong son of Morna, who, like thee, can guard our women from all peril. Gary turned from Finn in sullen silence, for he yearned to join the chase once more. In stature he was least of all the tribe, but none could be more fierce in conflict, fighting in the van, than that grim, wolfish, and misshapen man. Then Finn to Keoalt spake, and gave command to hasten forth before the Fian band, the king of scouts was he. And like the deer he sped to find if foemen had come near, fierce swarthy hillmen, waiting at the fords for combat eager, or red viking hordes from out the northern isles. In Alba wide no runner could keep pace by Keoalt's side. And ere the Fians, following in his path, had wended from the deep and dusky strath, he swept o'er Klein, and heard the awesome owls that hoot afar and near in woody foulness. And he had reached the slopes of fair Roskeen, ere Finn by Firish came. The dawn broke green, for the high huntsman of the morn had flung his mantle o'er his back. Stooping, he strung his silver bow, then rising bright and bold, he shot a burning arrow of pure gold that rent the heart of night. As far behind the Fians followed, Keoalt, like the wind, sped on, yon son of Ronan, o'er the wide and marshy moor, and thwart the mountain side, by Delny's shore far ebbed and wan and brown, and through the woods of beauteous Balnagown. The roaring streams he vaulted on his spear, and foaming torrents leapt as he drew near the sandy slopes of Nig. He climbed and ran till high above Dunscaith he stood to scan the outer ocean for the Viking ships, peering below his hand with panting lips agape, but wide and empty lay the sea, beyond the barrier crags of Cromarty, to the far skyline lying blue and bare, for no red pirate sought as yet to dare the gloomy hazards of the fitful seas, the gusty terrors and the treacheries of fickle April and its changing skies. 
and while he scanned the waves with curious eyes the sea-wind in his nostrils who had spent a long bleak winter in knockfarrel pent over the snow-wreathed strath and buried wood a sense of freedom tingled in his blood the large life of the ocean heaving wide his heart possessed with gladness and with pride and he rejoiced to be alive once more he heard the drenching waves on that rough shore raking the shingles and the sea-worn rocks sucking the brine through bared and lapping locks of bright brown tangle while the shelving ledges poured back the swirling waters o'er their edges and billows breaking on a precipice in spouts of spray fell spreading like a fleece sullen and sunken lay the reef with sleek and foaming lips before the flooded creek deep bunched with arrowy weed its green expanse wind-wrinkled and translucent a bright trance of sun-flung splendor lay athwart the wide blue ocean swept with loops of silvern tide heavily heaving in a long slow swell a lonely fisher in his coracle came round a headland lifted on a wave that bore him through the shallows to his cave nor other being he saw the birds that flew clamorous about the cliffs and diving drew their prey from bounteous waters on him cast cold beady eyes of wonder wheeling past and sliding down the wind two the warm sun shone on blind gray ossian musing all alone upon a knoll before the high stockade when oscar's son came nigh his hand he laid on the boy's curls and then his fingers strayed over the face and round the tender chin be thou as brave as oscar wise as finn said ossian with a sigh nay i would be a bard the boy made answer like to thee alas my son the gentle ossian said my song was born in sorrow for the dead o oh, may such grief as ossian's ne'er be thine if thou wouldst sing may thou below the pine murmuring thy dreams conceive and happy be nor hear but sorrow in the breaking sea and death sighs in the gale alas my song that rose in sorrow must survive in wrong my life is spent and vain a day of thine were better than a long dark year of mine but come my son so lead me by the hand to hear the sweetest harper in the land the wild free wind of spring all o'er the hills and under let us go by tuneful rills we'll wander and my heart shall sweetened be with echoes of the moorland melody my clarsock wilt thou bear and so they went together from knockfarrel long they lay within the woods of brahan and by the shore of silvery conan wended crossing o'er the ford at Ackleti, where ossian told the tale of finn who there had slain the bold black arky in his youth and ere the tale was ended they had crossed to Terradale, where dwelt a daughter of an ancient race deep learned in lore and with a gift to trace the thread of life in the dark web of fate and she to ossian cried thou comest late too late alas this day of all dark days knockfarrel is before me all ablaze a fearsome vision flaming to mine eyes o beating heart that bleeds i hear the cries of those that perish in yon high stockade o many a tender lad a lonesome maid sweet wife and sleeping babe and hero old o ossian couldst thou see o child behold yon ruddy closing clouds so falls the fate of all the tribe alas thou comest late three when ossian from knockfarrel went a band of merry maidens trooping hand in hand came forth with laughing eyes and flowing hair to share the freedom of the morning air adown the steep they went and through the wood where gary splintered logs in sullen mood pining to join the chase his wrath he wrought upon the trees that morn as if he fought against a hundred foemen from the west till he grew weary and was fain to rest the maids were wont to shower upon his head their merry taunts and oft from them he fled for of their quips and jests he had more fear than e'er he felt before a foeman's spear and so he chose to be alone the air was heavily laden with the odor rare of deep wind-shaken fir-trees breathing sweet as through the wood the maids with silent feet went treading needled sward in light and shade now bright now dim like flowers that gleam and fade and ever bloom and ever pass away upon a fairy hillock gary lay in sunshine fast asleep his head was bare and the wind rippling through his golden hair laid out the seven locks that were his pride which one by one the maids securely tied to tether pins while gary breathing deep moaned low and moved about in troubled sleep then to a thicket all the maidens crept and raised the call of warning 
Gary leapt from dreams that boded ill with sudden fear that a fierce band of foemen had come near. The seven fetters of his golden hair he wrenched off as he leapt, and so laid bare a shredded scalp of ruddy wounds that bled with bitter agony. The maidens fled with laughter through the wood, and climbed the path of steep Knockfarrel. Fierce was Gary's wrath when he perceived who wronged him. With a shriek that raised the eagles from the mountain peak, he shook his spear and ran with stumbling feet, and sought for vengeance, speedy and complete. The lust of blood possessed him, and he swore to slay them. But they shut the oaken door ere he had reached that high and strong stockade, from whence, alas, nor wife, nor child, nor maid, came forth again. 4. Soft couched upon a bank, lay Keowalt on the cliff-top, while he drank the sweetness of the morning air, that brought a spell of dreamful ease and pleasant thought, with memories from the deeps of other years, when Dermaid, unforgotten by his peers, and Oscar, fair and young, went forth with mirth, a-hunting o'er the hills around the firth, on such an April morn. He leapt to hear the Fians shouting from a woodland near their hunting call. Then swift he sped apace, with bounding heart, to join the gladsome chase. Stooping he ran with poised uplifted spear, as through the woods approached the nimble deer that swerved, beholding him. With startled toss of antlers down the slope it fled, to cross the open vale before him. To the west the Fians, merging from the woodland, pressed to head it shoreward. All the fierce hounds bayed with hungry ardor, and the deer, dismayed with foaming nostrils, leapt, and strove to flee towards the deep dark woods of Calrossi. But Keowalt, fresh from resting, was more fleet than deer or dogs, and sped with naked feet until upon a loose and sandy bank, plunging his spear into the smoking flank, its flight he stayed. He stabbed it as it sank, the life-blood spurting, and he saw it die, or ever dog or huntsman had come nigh. Then eager feast they made, and after long and frequent fast of winter they grew strong as they had been of old, and of their fare the lean and scrambling hounds had ready share. Nor overfed they in their merry mood, but set to hunt again, and through the wood scattered with eager pace, ere yet the sun had climbed to highest noon. For lo, each one had memory of the famished cheeks and white of those who waited their return by night, in steep Knockfarrel's desolate stockade. O many a beauteous and betrothed maid, and mothers nursing babies, and warriors lying in winter fever's spell, the old men dying, and slim fair lads who waited to acclaim, with gladsome shout, the huntsmen when they came with burdens of the chase. So they pursued the hunt till eve was nigh. In Genie's wood another deer they slew. Keowalt, who stood on a high ridge alone, with eager eyes scanning the prospect wide, in mute surprise saw rising o'er Knockfarrel a dark cloud of thick and writhing smoke. Then fierce and loud upon his horn he blew the warning blast. From out the woods the Fians hastened fast. Lo! When they stared towards the western sky, they saw their winter dwelling blazing high. Then fear possessed them for their own, and grief unutterable. And thus spake their wise chief, to whom came knowledge and the swift sure thought. Alas! alas! an enemy hath wrought black vengeance on our kind. In yonder gleam of fearsome flame the horrors of my dream are now accomplished. All we loved and cherished, and sought and fought for, in that pyre have perished white-lipped they heard. Then, wailing loud, they ran, following the nimble Keowalt, man by man, towards Knockfarrel, leaping on their spears o'er marsh and stream. MacRithan, blind with tears, tumbled or leapt into a swollen flood that swept him to the sea. But no man stood to help or mourn him, for the eve grew dim, and some there were, indeed, who envied him. 5. As snarls the wolf at bay within the wood on huntsmen and their hounds, so Gary stood raging before the women who had made secure retreat within the high stockade. He cursed them all, and their loud laughter rang more bitter to his heart than e'en the pang of his fierce wounds. Then, while his streaming blood half blinded him, he hastened to the wood, and a small tree upon his shoulders bore, and fixed it fast against the oaken door, that none might issue forth. Then once again towards the wood he turned, but all in vain the women waited his return, till they grew weary, for in pain and wrath he lay in a close thicket, brooding o'er his shame and panting for revenge. Then Finn's wife came to set the women to the wheel and loom, with angry chiding, and a heavy gloom fell on them all. Who knoweth, thus she spake, 
What evil may the Fian men o'ertake this day of evil omens? Yesternight I saw the pale ghost of my sire with white and trembling lips. At morn before my sight a raven darted from the wood and slew a brooding dove. What fear is mine, for who would defend us if our fierce foemen came? When Gary is against us, much I blame thy wanton deed. The women heard in shame, nor answer made. The sun, with fiery gleam, scattered the feathery clouds, as in a dream the spirits of the dead are softly swept from severed visions sweet. A low wind crept around with faltering steps, and pausing sighed, then fled to murmur from the mountainside amid the pine-tree shade, while all aglow Ben Wivis bared a crest of shining snow in barren splendor o'er the slumbering strath, while some sat trembling, fearing Gary's wrath, some feared the coming of the foe, and some had vague forebodings, and were brooding dumb, and longed to greet the huntsman. Mothers laid their babes to sleep, and many a gentle maid sighed for her lover in that lone stockade, and one who sat apart with pensive eye, thus sang to hear the peewee's plaintive cry. Peewee, peewee, crying sweet, crying early, crying late, will your voice be never weary, crying for your mate? Other hearts than thine are lonely, other hearts must wait. Peewee, peewee, I'd be flying o'er the hills and o'er the sea, till I found the love I long for, wheresoe'er he'd be. Peewee crying, I'd be flying, could I fly like thee. When Gary, who had staunched his wounds, arose, he seized his axe, and gan with rapid blows to fell down fir trees. Through the silent strath the hollow echoes rang. With fiendish wrath he made resolve to heap the splintered wood against the door, and burn the hated brood of his tormentors, one and all. He hewed an ample pyre, then piled it thick and high, while the sun, sloping to the western sky, proclaimed the closing of that fateful day. But the doomed women little dreamed that they would have such a fearsome end. As Gary lay rubbing the fire-sticks till they gan to glow, he heard a Fian mother singing low. Sleep, O oh sleep, I'll sing to thee. Mulaki, O oh Mulaki. Sleep, O oh sleep, like yon grey stone, Mulaki, mine own. Sleep, O oh sleep, nor sigh, nor fret ye, And the goblins will not get ye, I will shield ye, I will pet ye, Mulaki, mine own. The mother sang, the gentle babe made moan, And Gary heard them with a heart of stone. With fiendish laugh he saw the leaping flames Possess the pyre, he heard the shrieking dames And maids and children wailing in the gloom Of smothering smoke, ere they had met their doom. Then when the high stockade was blazing red, ere yet their cries were silenced, Gary fled, and westward o'er the shouldering hills he sped. 6. A broad faint twilight lingered to unfold the sun's slow-dying beams of tangled gold, and the long billowy hills in gathering shade their naked peaks and ebon crags displayed, sharp-rimmed against the tender heaven and pale, and misty shadows gathered in the vale, when Keowalt to Knockfarrel came, and saw, amid the dusk, with sorrow and with awe, the ruins of their winter dwelling laid in smouldering ashes, while the high stockade around the rocky wall, like ragged teeth, was crackling o'er the melting stones beneath, still darting flame and flickering in the breeze. He sped towards the wood, and through the trees called loud for those who perished. On his fair and gentle spouse he called in his despair his sweet son, and his sire, whose hair was white as Wivis snow, he called for in the night. Full loud and long across the strath he cried, the echoes mocked him from the mountainside. Ah, when his last hope faded like the wave of twilight ebbing o'er the hills, he gave his heart to utter grief and deep despair, and the cold stars peered down with pitiless stare, while sank the wind in silence on its flight through the dark hollows of the spacious night and distant sounds seemed near. In his dismay he heard a Fian calling far away. The night-bird answered back with dismal cry, like a wounded man about to die. But Keowalt's lips were silent. Once again and nearer came the voice that cried in vain. Then swift steps climbed Knockfarrel's barren steep, and Alvin called with trembling voice and deep to Keowalt crouching low with bended head. Who liveth? I am here alone, he said. Thus Fian after Fian came to share their bitter grief in silence and despair. All night they kept lone watch until the dawn with stealthy fingers o'er the east had drawn its dewy veil and dim. 
Then Finn arose from deep and sleepless brooding o'er his woes, and spake unto the Fians, Who shall rest while flees our evil foemen farther west? Arise! But who hath done this deed, they sighed, and Finn made answer, Gary. Then they cried for vengeance swift and terrible, and leapt to answer Finn's command. A cold wind swept from out the gates of morning, moaning loud, as swift they hastened forth. A ragged shroud of gathering tempest o'er Ben Wivis cast, a sudden gloom, and round it, falling fast, it drifted o'er the darkened slopes and bare, and snowflakes swirled in the chill morning air. Then o'er the sea the sun leapt large and bright, scattering the storm, and moor and crag lay white, as westward o'er the hills the Fians all in quest of Gary sped. At evenfall they found him, on the bald and rocky side of steep scour Vullen, Gary lay to hide within a cave, which, backward o'er the snow, he entered that his steps might seem to show he had fled eastward by the path he came. All day he sought to flee them in his shame, watching from lofty crag or deep ravine, and crouching in the heath with haggard mien, he sought in vain to hide till darkness cast its blinding cloak betwixt them. When at last Finn cried, Come forth, thou dog of evil deeds, nor respite seek. His limbs like wind-swept reeds trembled and bent beneath him, so he rose, and came to meet his friends who were his foes. Then unto Finn he spake with accents meek, One last request I of the Fian seek, whom I have loved in peace and served in strife. Tis thine, said Finn, but ask not for thy life, for thou art among the Fians. I would die, said Gary, with my head laid on thy thigh, and let young Alvin take thy sword, that he may give the death that will mine honour be. "'Twas so he lay to die, but as the blade swept bright, young Alvin, keen for vengeance, swayed, and slipped upon the sword, and his fierce blow that Gary slew, the Fian chief, laid low. A grievous wound was gaping on his thigh, and poured his life-blood forth. A low, weird cry the great Finn gave, as he fell back and swooned. In vain they strove to staunch the fearsome wound. His life ebbed slowly with the sun's last ray, in gathering gloom. And when in death he lay, the glory of the Fians passed away. End of the Fians of Knockfarrel Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter 17 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 17 her evil eye. O Mary Du, the weaver's wife, will have the evil eye. The fear will come about my heart when she'll be passing by. She'll have the piercing look to wound the very birds that fly. I would not have her evil wish, I would not have her praise, for like the shadow would her curse me follow all my days. When she my churning will speak well, no butter can I raise. O Mary Dew will have the eye to wound the very deer. Ah, would she scowl upon my bairns when her they would come near? They'll have the red cords round their necks, so they'll have naught to fear. It's Murdo Ban, the luckless man, against her would prevail. And first her eye was on his churn, then on the milking pail. When she would praise the brindled cow, the cow began to ail. The trout that gamble in the pool she'll wound when she goes past, then weariness will come upon the fins that flicked so fast, and one by one the lifeless things will on the stones be cast. O Mary Dew, you gave yon sprain to poor Dunpara's arm. It is myself would have the work undoing of the harm. I'd twist around the three-ply cord well knotted o'er the charm. Your eye you'd put on yon sweet babe o' Lachlan, o' Loch Glass. He'd fill the wooden ladle where the dead and living pass, and with the water, silver charmed, he'd save his little lass. I'll lock my cheese within the chest, my butter I will hide. I'll bar the byre at milking time, although you'll wait outside. You'll maybe go another way. Who'll care for you to bide? End of Her Evil Eye Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa
Chapter 18 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 18 A Cursing. So you're coming, ye reavers and rogues, when the men will be fighting afar. Oh, all the McQuithans are bold when it's only with women they'll war. Weasels that creep in the dark, foxes that prowl in the night. Rats that are hated and vile. Oh, hasten you, out of my sight. Oh, my cow you would take from my buyer? This day will the beggars be brave. You'd be lifting the thatch from the roof if you had na a roof to your cave. Your chief, he's the lord of the lies. A windbag his wife, with the brag. Your clan is the pride of the thieves. Whose meal will you have in your bag? Now, last pug Macian may blush. Oh, he'll be the sorrowful man. His fame for the thieving is gone to the reavers and rogues of your clan. You'll spare me so old and so frail, fitter to die than to live. But maybe I'll slay with the tongue and the heart that will never forgive. The curse of the frail will be strong, the curse of the widow be sure. Oh, the curse of the wronged will avenge. Black, black is the curse of the poor. Ha! Laugh at your ease while you can. Laugh, it's the devil's turn next. For after I'm done with you all, Oh, who will be doleful and vexed? Bare need on the ground will I go, My hair on my shoulders let fall. Now hear me, and never forget My curses I'll cast on you all. Little increase to your clan, The downmouth to you and to yours, The blight on your little black cave, The luck o' oh, a Friday on moors. Fire upon land be your lot, Drowning in storm on the deep. Leave not a son to succeed, Leave not a daughter to weep. Here's the bad meeting to you, Death without priest be your fate. Go to your grandfather's house, The son of the cursing will wait. Footnote to Macquithans This clan, which had an evil reputation, is extinct. End footnote. Footnote to Laspwig McKeon, a famous thief. End footnote. Footnote to Grandfather's House, the grave. End footnote. Footnote to Son of the Cursing, the devil. End footnote. End of A Cursing. Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 19 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 19 Leobag's Warning. Would Murdo make the wry mouth? Is Eily cross eyed? O oh, mock no more the beggar man, you'll scorn with pride. The wind that will be blowing west might turn and blow south. O oh, Eily, it would fix your eyes and Murdo's wry mouth. O oh, mind ye of the Leobag, and yon rock cod. Ho, oh, there's the mouth, the cute one cried, for the hook and the rod. The tide it would be turning while the Leobag would mock, and that is why it's gaping as it gaped below the rock. Footnote to Leobag, the flounder. End footnote. End of Leobag's warning. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 20 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese. Chapter 20 Tober Moire, Well of St. Mary. Tis for thee I will be pining, Tober Moire. Thou art deep and sweet and shining, Tober Moir. In the dimness I'll be dying, And my soul for thee is sighing, With the blessings on thee lying, Tober Moir. O thy cool sweet waters dripping, Tober Moir. Now my sere lips would be sipping, Tober Moir. O my lips are sere and burning, For thy waters I'll be yearning, 
and yon road of no returning, Tober Moire. O thy coolness and thy sweetness, Tober Moire. O thy sureness and completeness, Tober Moire. O this life I would be leaving, with the grayness of its grieving, and the deeps of its deceiving, Tober Moire. I would sip thy waters holy, Tober Moire, while the drops of life drip slowly, Tober Moire. Till the wings of angel whiteness, with their softness and their lightness, blind me, fold me in their brightness, Tober Moire. End of Tober Moire. Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 21 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 21. Sleepy Song. Sung by Grain to Diarmid in their flight from the Fians. Sleep a little, O oh, Diarmid, Diarmid. Sleep in the deep lone cave. Sleep a little, a little, little. Love whom my love I gave. Wearily falls, O oh, Diarmid, Diarmid. Wearily falls the wave. Sleep a little, O oh, Diarmid, Diarmid. Sleep, and have never a fear. Sleep a little, a little, little. Love whom I love so dear. A weary wind, O oh, Diarmid, Diarmid. A weary wind I hear. Sleep a little, O oh, Diarmid, Diarmid. Sleep, while I watch till you wake. Sleep a little, a little, little. Love whom I'll ne'er forsake. Sleep a little, and blessings on you, my lamb, or my heart will break. End of Sleepy Song Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 22 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 22 Song of the Sea the sea sings loud, the sea sings low, And sweet is the chime of its ebb and flow Over the shingly strand. For its strange sweet song that woos my ear, The first man heard as the last shall hear, Seeking to understand. End of Song of the Sea Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 23 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 23 The Death of Cuchulin. Now, when the last hour of his life drew nigh, Cuchulin woke from dreams forewarning death. As cold and awesome came the night bird's cry, an evil omen, the magician saith. A low gust panted like a man's last breath as morning crept into the chamber black. Then all his weapons clashed and tumbled from the rack. For the last time his evil foemen came, the sons of Calatin, by Lugade led. The land lay smouldering with smoke and flame, the duns were fallen, and the fords ran red. And widows fled, lamenting for their dead. To fair Emania, on that fateful day, where, all forsworn with fighting, great Cuchulain lay. Leverchan, whom he loved, a maid most fair, rose-lipped with yellow hair and sea-gray eyes, the evil tidings to Cuchulain bare. And, trembling in her beauty, bade him rise, Niam, brave Connell's queen, the old, the wise, urged him with clamor of the land's alarms, and, stirred with vengeful might, the hero sprang to arms. His purple mantle o'er his shoulders wide in haste he flung, and towering o'er them stood, all scarred and terrible in battle-pride, his brooch, that clasped his mantle and his hood, then fell to his foot to pierce, and his red blood followed, like fate, behind him as he stepped. Leverchen shrieked, and Niam moaned his doom, and wept. Thus sallying forth, he called his charioteer, and bade him yoke the war-steeds of his choice. The grey of Macha, shuddering in fear, had scented death, and pranced with fearsome noise. 
but when it heard Cuchulain's chiding voice, meekly it sought the chariot to be bound, and wept big tears of blood before him on the ground. Then to his chariot leapt the lord of war. O oh, leave me not, Leverchen cried in woe. Thrice fifty queens, who gathered from afar, moaned with one voice, Ah, wouldst thou from us go? They smote their hands, and fast their tears did flow. Cuchulain's chariot thundered o'er the plain. Full well he knew that he would ne'er return again. How vehement and how beautiful they swept, the grey of Macha and the black most bold, and keen-eyed Lake, the watchful and adept, nor turned nor spake, as on the chariot rolled the steeds he urged with his red goad of gold. Stooping he drave, with winged cloak and spheres, slender and tall and red, the king of charioteers. Cuchulain stood impatient for the fray, his golden-hilted bronze sword on his thigh. A sharp and venomous dart beside him lay. He clasped his ashen spear, bronze-tipped and high, as flames the sun upon the western sky. His round shield from afar was flashing bright, figured with radiant gold and rimmed with silver white. Stern-lipped he stood, his great broad head thrown back, the white pearls sprayed upon his thick dark hair. Deep-set his eyes, beneath his eyebrows black, were swift and grey, and fixed his fearless stare. Red-edged his white hood flamed, his tunic rare of purple gleamed with gold, his cloak behind his shoulders shone with silver, floating in the wind. Betimes three crones him meet upon the way, half-blind and evil-eyed with matted hair, workers of spells and witcheries are they, the brood of Calatin, beware, beware. They proffer of their fulsome food a share, and stay with us a while, a false crone cries, unseemly is the strong who would the weak despise. He fain would pass, but leapt upon the ground, the proud, the fearless, for sweet honour's sake. With spells and poisons had they cooked a hound, of which he was forbidden to partake. But his name charm the brave Cuchulain brake, and their foul food he in his left hand took. Eftsoons his former strength that arm and side forsook. For, O Cuchulain, couldst thou e'er forget, when fast by Kulan's fort on yon black night thou foughtst and slew the band-dog, dark as jet, which scared the thief and put the foe to flight. A tender youth thou wert of warrior might, and all the land did with thy fame resound, as Cathbad the magician named thee Kulan's hound. Loud o'er mid Luichair road the chariot rolled, Round Shab Fuad, desolate and grand, Till, ere with hate the hero did behold, Hastening to sweep the foemen from the land, His sword flashed red and radiant in his hand, In sunny splendour was his spear upraised, And hovering o'er his head the light of heroes blazed. He comes, he comes, cried Air, as he draw near, Await him, men of Erin, and be strong, their faces blanched, their bodies shook with fear. Now link thy shields, and close together throng, And shout the war-cry, loud and fierce and long. Then air, with cunning of his evil heart, Set heroes forth in pairs, to feign to fight apart. As furious tempests, that in deep woods roar, Assault the giant trees, and lay them low. As billows toss the seaweed on the shore, As sweeping sickles do the ripe fields mow. Cuchulain, rolling fiercely on the foe, broke through the linked ranks upon the plain, to drench the field with blood, and round him heap the slain. And when he reached a warrior pair that stood in feigned strife upon a knoll of green, their weapons clashing but unstained with blood, a satirist him besought to intervene, whereat he slew them as he drave between. Thy spear to me, the satirist cried the while, the hero answering, nay, he cried, I'll thee revile. Reviled for churlishness, I ne'er have been, Cuchulain called, uprising in his pride, and cast his ashen spear, bronze-tipped and keen, and slew the satirist, and nine beside. Then his fresh onslaught made the host divide and flee before him, clamoring with fear, the while the stealthy Lugade seized Cuchulain's spear. O sons of Calatin, did Lugade call, what falleth by the weapon I hold here? Together they acclaimed, A king will fall, for so foretold, they said, the aged seer. Then at the chariot he flung the spear, and Leigh was stricken unto death and fell. Cuchulain drew the spear, and bade a last farewell. The victor I, and eke the charioteer. 
he cried, and drave the war-steeds fierce and fast. Another pair he slew, to me thy spear, again a satirist called. The spear was cast, and through the satirist and nine men passed, but Lugaid grasps it, and again doth call, What falleth by this spear? They shout, A king will fall. Then fall, cried Lugaid, as he flung the spear, the grey of Macha sank in death's fierce throes, snapping the yoke, the while the black ran clear. Cuchulin groaned and dashed upon his foes, another pair he slew with rapid blows, and eke the satirist, and nine men near. Then once more Lugaid sprang to seize the charmed spear. What falleth by this weapon? he doth call. A king will fall, they answer him again. But twice before ye said, A king will fall. They cried, The king of steeds hath fled the plain, and lo, the king of charioteers is slain. For the last time he drave the spear full well, and smote the great Cuchulin, and Cuchulin fell. The black steed snapped the yoke, and left alone the king of heroes dying on the plain. I fain would drink, they heard Cuchulin groan, from out yon loch, he thirsted in fierce pain. We give thee leave, but thou must come again, his foemen said, then low made answer he, If I will not return, I'll bid you come to me. His wound he bound, and to the loch did hie, and drank his drink, and washed, and made no moan. Then came the brave Cuchulin forth to die, sublimely fearless, strengthless, and alone. He wended to the standing pillar stone, clutching his sword and leaning on his spear, and to his foemen called, Come ye, and meet me here. A vision swept upon his fading brain, a passing vision glorious and sweet. That hour of youth returned to him again, when he took arms with fearless heart a beat, as Cathbad the magician did repeat, Who taketh arms upon this day of grief, his name shall live for ever, and his life be brief. Fronting his foes, he stood with fearless eye, his body to the pillar stone he bound, nor sitting nor down lying would he die. He would die standing, so they gathered round in silent wonder on the blood-drenched ground, and watched the hero who with death could strive, but no man durst approach. He seemed to be alive. End of the Death of Cuchulain Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter Twenty Four of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter Twenty Four, Lost Songs. Harp of my fathers on the mouldering wall of days forgotten, like a far-off wind, hushing the fir wood at soft even fall, thy low-heard whispers to my heart recall the wistful songs, to silence old consigned that Ossian sang when he was frail and blind. Thy fitful notes from the melodious trees I fain would echo in my feeble rhyme. The inner music quivering on the breeze I hear, and throbbing from the beating seas, on ancient shores the wearied pulse of time that mingles with thy melody sublime. End of Lost Songs Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter Twenty Five of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter Twenty Five, The Dream. Twas when I woke, I knew it was a dream, measured by moments that to me did seem a lifelong spell of joy and peace to be. Will that last dream that comes ere death descends? from which I shall not wake to know it ends, thus seem to live on through eternity? End of the Dream Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter 26 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees Chapter 26. Free Will Say not the will of man is free within the limits of his soul. Who from his heritage can flee? 
who can his destiny control? In vain we wage perpetual strife Against instincts dumb and blind desires. Who leads must serve, the pulse of life Throbs with the dictates of our sires. Since when the world began to be, And life through hidden purpose came, From sire to son unceasingly The task bequeathed hath been the same. We strive, while fetters bind us fast, We seek to do what needs must be, we move through bondage with the past in service to posterity. End of Free Will Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 27 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Reese Chapter 27 Strife Weary of strife, the surge and clash of city life, I sought for peace in solitude, Within the hushed and darkened wood, And on the lonesome moor, But found contending leaf and root Engaged in conflict fierce, though mute, While what was frail was slain By what was strong in dire dispute, I sought for peace in vain, The world, sustained by strife, Endures in pain. All things that are in conflict be, I murmured on the shelving strand, Where struggling winds would fain be free, The tide in conflict with the wind's command, Turned tossing wearily. I heard the loud sea laboring to the land, I saw the dumb land striving with the sea. End of Strife Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Chapter 28 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 28. Sonnet. Written in the Stone Gallery of St. Paul's. The drowsing city sparkles in the heat, and murmur in mine ears unceasingly the surging tides of that vast human sea, the billows of life that break with muffled beat, and vibrate through this high and lone retreat while over all, serene and fair and free, thy dome is reared in naked majesty, grey old St. Paul's, in thee the ages meet, slumbering amidst the trophies of their strife. And in their dreams thou hearest, while the cries of triumph and despair ascend from life, the murmurings of immortality, thou sentinel of hope that doth despise what was and is not, waiting what shall be. End of Sonnet. Recording by Matthew Rees. Davenport, Iowa. Chapter 29 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 29. Out of the Mouths of Babes. Is baby dead? He whispered with wide eyes, tearless, but full of eloquent regret, his childish face, grown prematurely wise, pondering the problem death before him set. Baby is dead, I answered, as I laid my hand on her frail forehead with a sigh. Oh, Daddy, why did God do this? he said, and silently my heart made answer. Why? He touched her white, worn face and said, how cold is our wee baby now! His eyes were deep. Then came his little brother, two years old. He looked and lisped. The baby is asleep. End of Out of the Mouths of Babes Recording by Matthew Rees Davenport, Iowa Chapter 30 of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. Mackenzie this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matthew Rees. Chapter 30. Notes. The Wee Folk. In Gaelic they are usually called the Peace People, Sithkian. Other names are Wee Folk, Dion Biega, Light Folk, 
slauch utram, etc. As in the lowlands, they are referred to as greed folk and greed neighbors. The Banshee, Bansheath. Sometimes referred to as the Fairy Queen, sometimes as the Green Lady. She sings a song while she washes the clothes of one about to meet a swift and tragic fate. In the Fian poems, she converses with those who see her, and foretells the fate of warriors going to battle. The Blue Men of the Minch, Na Fir Gorm. Between the Shant Isles, Charmed Isles, and Lewis is the stream of the Blue Men. They are the seahorses of the island gales. Their presence in the strait was believed to be the cause of its billowy restlessness and swift currents. THE CHANGELING When the fairies robbed a mother of her babe, they left behind a useless old and peevish fairy, who took the form of a child. This belief may have originated in the assumption that, when a baby became ill and fretful, it was a changeling. The urisk is, if anything, a personification of fear. It is a silent, cloudy shape which haunts lonely moors, and follows travellers, but rarely does more than scare them. My Fairy Lover Fairies fell in love with human beings, and deserted them when their love was returned. Women of unsound mind, given to wandering alone in solitary places, were believed to be the victims of fairy love. Yon Fairy Dog, and Kusith, was heard howling on stormy nights. He was big as a stirk, one informant has declared. The fearsome tale appears to have been not the least impressive thing about it. The macadrums were brave and fearless, and were supposed to be descended from the seals, which were believed to be human beings under spells. My Gunna This kindly but solitary elf herded cattle by night and prevented them from falling over the rocks. He was seen only by those gifted with the faculty of second sight. The Gunna resembles the lowland brownie. Her evil eye. Belief in the evil eye is still quite common, even among educated people, in the highlands. Not a few children wear the cord to which a silver coin is appended, as a charm against the influence of the eye. The little old man of the barn, Borchen Sabail. Like the gunna, he is a variety of the kindly brownie, and assisted the needy. Nimble men, na fir clis, are the merry dancers, or aurora borealis. It was believed that when the streamers were colored, the men and maids were dancing, and that after the dance the lovers fought for the love of the queen. When the streamers are particularly vivid, a pink cloud is seen below them, and this is called the pool of blood. It drips upon bloodstones, the spots on which are referred to as fairy blood, fuil siocher. A wizard could, by waving his wand, summon the nimble men to dance in the northern sky. The water horse haunted lonely locks, and lured human beings to a terrible death. When a hand was laid on its mane, power to remove it was withdrawn. A cursing. The Gaelic curses are quaint in translation, but terrible in the original. Bonach Falade. It was considered unlucky to throw away the remnants of a baking. So the good wife made a little bannock, which was pierced in the middle, as a charm against fairy influence. It was given to a child for performing an errand, but the charm would be broken if the reason for gifting it were explained. That was the good wife's secret. It was also unlucky to count the bannocks, and when they fell, bad luck was foretold. Finlay's bannock was not kneaded on the board or placed on the brander, but, unlike the other bannocks, was toasted in front of the fire. The Gruagach was a gentlemanly brownie, who haunted buyers. It was never seen, although its shadow occasionally danced on the wall as it flitted about. Often, when chased, it was heard tittering round corners. In some barns, Klach na Gruagach, the Gruagach's stone, is still seen. Milkers pour an offering of milk into the hollowed stone for luck. The cream might not rise, and the churn yield no butter if this service were neglected. A favorite trick of the Gruagach was to untie the cattle in the byre, so as to bring out the milkmaid, especially if she had forgotten to leave the offering of milk. Tober Moire, St. Mary's Well, is situated at Terradale, Rossshire. When a sick person asks for a drink of Tober Moire water, 
it is taken as a sign of approaching death. It is a curious thing that this reverence for holy water should be perpetuated among a Presbyterian people. Wishing and curative wells are numerous in the north. The Fians of Knockfarrel This story belongs to the Oceanic or Fian cycle of Gaelic tales in prose and verse. Hugh Miller makes reference to it, but speaks of the Fians as giants. In Strathpeffer district, the tale is well known, and it is referred to in Waifs and Strays of Celtic Tradition. It is also localized in Skye. There are several Fian place names in the Highlands. The warriors are supposed to lie in a charmed sleep in Craigahow Cave, near Munlochy, Rossshire. Cawalt, the swift runner, was a famous Fian. Finn was chief, and Gaul and Gary were of Clan Morna, which united with the Fians. Mulachi is a little babe, and Clarsach a harp. Leobag's Warning Children who twist their mouths or squint are warned that, if the wind changes, their contortions will remain. The fate of the flounder, which mocked the cod, is cited as a terrible example. Khan, son of the red, is a Fian tale in which several old Gaelic versions have been collected. Gaul, the first hero of the Fians, slew the red when Khan, his son, was seven years old. In the fullness of time the young hero, whom his enemies admire as well as fear, crossed the sea to avenge his father's death, and engaged in a long and fierce duel with Gaul. Death of Cuchulain is from the Cuchulain cycle of Bronze Age heroic tales. The enemy have invaded and laid waste to the province of Ulster, and the chief warriors of the Red Branch, except Cuchulain, who must needs fight alone, are laid under spells by the magicians of the invaders. The poem is suffused with evidences of magical beliefs and practices. Cuchulain goes forth knowing that he will meet his doom. His name signifies Hound of Culan. In his youth he slew Culan's ferocious watchhound, which attacked him, and took its place until another was trained. It was Gaius, taboo, for him to partake of the flesh of a hound, his totem, or eat at a cooking hearth, but he must needs accept the hospitality of the witches. The satirists are satirical bards who, it was believed, could not only lampoon a hero, but infuse their compositions with magical powers like incantations. Cuchulain cannot be slain except by his own spear, which he must deliver up to a satirist who demands it. Imania, the capital of Ulster, was the home of the Red Branch warriors. Sleepy Song When Diarmid eloped with Grianne, as Paris did with Helen, the Fians followed them, so that Finn, their chief, might be avenged. Diarmid, who is the unwilling victim of Grain's spells, dreads to meet Finn, and is in constant fear of discovery. End of Notes Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa End of Elves and Heroes by Donald A. McKenzie